what nation, tribe? You know, the answer is Geats, G-E-A-T-S. But if you remember, every now and then in class, I would pronounce that Yats, like Y-E-A-T-S. And one person put down Yeats, or Yates, Y-E-A-T-S. I went ahead and accepted it because that is an acceptable pronunciation for Old English G-E-A-T-S. Um, you'll hear various scholars pronounce that word two different ways, okay? Um, yeah, just send me a list of them and I'll try to get it uh, done. And what I may do is I may do a visual thing and upload it to YouTube, a personal, a private thing, and send you the link. Cool. Okay. Uh, not so gallant every night. Though I'm hoping we get to so gallant every night. I said it'd be 30 minutes and then 45, so we'll see. Uh, lawn ball. Nope, that's Bisclum, ready? Lost my place. I'm not going to, I'm going to try to go through this quickly because I use lawn ball to introduce really these things, okay? Courtly love, chivalry, courtly behavior, not as much for the story itself. Um, I mean, we could spend a long time talking about the story, but Sir Gowan and the Green Knight's long, <laughs> really long, and I, I don't want to get too backed up, but I can guarantee you we will. We won't get as backed up as we did in Beowulf, because we will actually get to the Renaissance um, the last day of class. Uh, kidding, it'll be before then. So look at how Lawn Ball begins. Okay, notice where we're told it happens. Carlisle, not Camelot. Carlisle's northwestern depending on how you want to count the border, modern day Northwestern England, is that right? Yeah, Northwestern England, Southwestern Scotland. Carlisle is one of the suggested locations for where Camelot was, okay? Glastonbury is another one. Um, Tintagel on the Welsh coast is another one. Uh, Colchester in southeast England, just north and east of London is another one. Its Latin name was Camulodunum, pretty close to Camelot. In fact, uh, an American author, Frank Bryce, something like that, wrote a whole series of, of Arthurian novels based on Camulodunum, Colchester as being the... Um, capital. So, it's at Car Carlisle. On account of the Scots and Picts who are ravaging the country, they came into the land of Egypt, blah, blah, blah. It's Pentecost. Okay. Why would the poet mention, or why would the story begin with the mentioning of Pentecost? I mean, it gives us a time frame for when the story is set. It also gives us a larger time frame for within the world of Arthur. And that world is therefore what? It's Christian. Arthur's not some pagan hero, okay? He's a Christian hero. And what are we told Arthur is doing? <coughs> he gave many gifts, uh, both to counts and to noblemen, to the members of the round table. They had no equal in all the world. He shared out wives, and it doesn't mean they're wife swapping. He means he's allowing his knights to marry, you know, um, the women that were available, so to speak, to everyone who had served him except for one. Okay. And that one being Lawnball. We don't know why. The poem never tells us. Why is Lawnball singled out for... What's he singled out for? What, what's the word you want to use to describe how he's treated? Disfavor? I mean, he's definitely not in favor, okay? Whom he does not nor, whom he does not remember, nor do any of his men favor him. So it's like Lonval's the, the sore thumb. He's the one who doesn't belong, okay? 
For his valor, his generosity, his beauty, his prowess, most people envied him. That could be the reason why he's disfavored. They're jealous. Okay? <clears throat> Many a one pretended to love him who wouldn't have complained for a moment if something had befallen the night. Lonville's being rich. Who's supposed to be the greatest of the Arthurian knights? Again, it varies depending upon the story you're reading. Lancelot, the most valiant. Sir Gawain, or Gawain, however you want to pronounce that name, is often right there with him. Galahad is the most holy, has the vision of the Holy Grail. Percival, again, depending upon which version, is the one who attains the Holy Grail. And then you have all the others, okay? He's a king's son, high lineage, far from his heritage, part of the king's household. He'd spent all his wealth, for the king gave him nothing. A little bit of economic advice there. Don't spend all you have when you don't have a steady income stream, you know. Nor did Lonval ask him for anything. Now that's probably told the audience <clears throat> because the implication is the other knights probably do ask for something. Part of the Lord Thane relationship. So we're told now Lanval's unhappy, he's anxious. Okay? And notice the, the narrator of the poem. The speaker of the poem says, Lords, do not wonder. So what are we being told right there in that sentence? Being told to lords. The audience. The audience is composed of or comprises lords and ladies. Right? Think of the, the material that's in here. Think of the material that we will see in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. And then later on when we get to even Chaucer, I really wish we had time to do a whole lot more of Chaucer, but uh, even when I, the one, I think I taught Chaucer once. At the graduate level I taught it, we did all of the Canterbury Tales. Um, when you read this kind of literature, you've got to keep your mind on who the audience is. Because we're going to hear descriptions of things in this and in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight that it is clear we are talking to a high status audience. Because the people who are breaking their backs and hands, working in the fields, doing hard manual labor from sun up to sundown every day, and then you know going into the not so warm home and eating slop and going to bed, are not going to appreciate hearing the language describing the rich attire, the sumptuous food, the delicacies of this kind of environment. Why? Because that's what leads to the Peasants' Revolt. That's what leads to Occupy Wall Street. It's the one percenters to the 99 percenters. Okay? So, Lords, do not wonder. A foreign man without support is very sorrowful in another land when he does not know where to seek help. Notice, we're not told that Lonval doesn't seek help. We're told he doesn't know where to seek help. Okay? So what does he do? He'd serve the king well, and one day he gets on his horse and he rides out. He's thinking, physical exertion will be good for me. By the way, psychologists will tell you, if you're down in the dumps, if you're depressed, work. Do physical, back-breaking, muscle-aching work. Why? It forces your mind to not think about your problems. What's the problem that the wanderer has? Think about it. He's out there. He's in the boat. He wakes up. He's in the same position every day. He rows, but, you know, he falls asleep full of troubles, and he wakes up full of those same troubles. So he goes out, comes to a meadow, dismounts beside running water. Horse trembles terribly. And you've got a gloss down there. The Celtic of the world is often reached by crossing a stream or other body of water. So the implication is that the horse can sense its proximity here. It's kind of like in um, Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening. They stop in the middle of the woods, read the poem. It's one of Frost's absolutely most beautiful. 
the rider and the horse stop in the middle of woods on a snowy evening, and they just stand there. And the wood, we're told, fills up with snow. So they're not just stopping for a couple of minutes. And the horse, we're told, shakes its harness. Okay? That could indicate two things. Burr, it's cold. And also, the snow's piling up on the horse. And the horse is like, if we don't move, we're going to die. Suicide is often read to be the theme of that poem. That the guy stops in the middle of the snowy woods because he's done. He's tired of living. And he just wants to lie down in the snow sleep but he has miles to go and appointments to keep we're told at the end of the poem so the horse acts jittery now it might be because the portal to the other world is open or it might be because the horse senses there are other beings there that cannot be seen with the normal eyes okay so Lonval does what I said the other day you should never do in a work of Middle English literature. Go off to a meadow, cross over a stream, lay down next to a tree, and take a nap. Notice, when he lays down, we're told, line 51 or so, he's very worried about his difficult situation. He sees nothing that pleases them. And then he sees two maidens. So he lies down. He doesn't quite go to sleep. But he's full of angst. And then he sees two maidens. And they come up to him. One is older than the other. They're both gorgeous. They're both carrying things. And they know him by name. Sir Longo, my lady, who is most noble, wise, and beautiful. This is line 71. Who is most noble, wise, and beautiful, sends us for you. How does she know who he is? How, do, how does she know Lonval was going to be there? Now come along with us. We will take you there safely. Look, the pavilion is right close by. And it's like, and suddenly, it appears. Now, and I mean that both literally and figuratively. Like, when he got off his horse, he was the only thing in the area. Now, he, it appears he can see this pavilion, or at the very least, they don't have to go very far. He goes with them. He takes no need of his horse. Notice he's going to walk there, which is an indication it's very close by. Okay? They led him to, up to the tent. Beautiful, well-situated. And what does the poet do? It starts, the poet starts comparing the beauty, the richness, etc., of this pavilion with characters from classical literature. Okay? Which is telling us the audience had to be familiar with these characters from classical literature. If you make a comparison of things and people don't understand the thing that it's being compared to, that comparison is totally meaningless, right? Not Queen Semiramis when she had her greatest wealth and greatest power and greatest wisdom, nor the Emperor Octavian, Caesar Octavius, you know, etc. A golden eagle is set on top of it. Why? Legion standard. Louder? It's a legion standard. Okay, it is a Roman legion standard. What else is it? It's an aspect of royalty. Eagles, king of the birds, king of the creatures of the air. This isn't, you know, just some high-ranking lady. This is the high-ranking lady. Okay? And he talks about the value of the tent, etc. No king under heaven could buy them for any wealth he might offer. Well, what king's been mentioned so far? Arthur. Not even Arthur could afford this tent. Inside the tent was the maiden. She surpassed in beauty the lily on the new rose when it appears, uh, the lily or the new rose when it appears in summer. 
right? It's talking about two things. One, her beauty. Two, her youth. Doesn't mean she's nine years old, but she is in the prime of her life in terms of her physical beauty, all right, and age. Um, she lay on a very beautiful bed. Sheets, sheets, just the sheets were worth a castle. You know, you go to the store, you can buy 250 count, 300, 400, 500, you pay a lot of money, a thousand count thread. This is like, I don't know, 10,000 threads to the square inch. This is so fine, it's like sleeping on water almost. And she's lying there. Notice, she lay on a very beautiful bed. Pause. The sheets were worth a castle. Pause. Lost my place. In nothing but her shift. What's the poet emphasizing? What's, we'll say Marie de France, since we know who the poet is this time. What is de France emphasizing? Not the bed, not the sheets. The reason you get the little pauses is to build the suspense to what the lady is lying in, okay? Her shift, her, or to use the French, her chemise, or chemise, if you want to pronounce it American, American-y, okay? A nighty is what this is, a nightgown. Her body was very elegant and comely. She had thrown on for warmth a costly mantle of white ermine. Again, royalty. You know, when you see the people dressed um, like Queen Elizabeth every year when she would open Parliament, okay? She would go out there, she'd go out there in the royal robes, and the robes were crimson, red, and around the top, the neck, white. It's ermine. Only royalty was allowed to wear that, okay? So a costly mantle, mantle goes around the, the neck and shoulders, of white ermine lined with Alexandrine silk. Again, very costly. Her side was entirely uncovered, her face, her neck, and her breast. That's telling us what is meant by her side. So apparently she's like lying on her side, and the ermine comes a little bit around here, but the rest of her is uncovered. She was whiter than hawthorn blossom. Hawthorn blossom is like the white on the white of the page. The knight went forward and the maiden called to him. He sat beside the bed. Interesting. He sits beside the bed. When we get to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and a lady in the poem does her temptation of Sir Gowan, she doesn't sit beside the bed. She sits on his bed. In fact, she sits next to him and puts her arms one on the right side of him and one on the left side. So she's kind of leaning over him, almost like she's pinning him to the bed. Yeah, and there's all kinds of innuendo going on there. So he sits next to her. And she says, Lonval, handsome friend, for you I have come out of my own land. We're being told this isn't fairyland. This isn't the Celtic of the world. This is our world. And she and her train, her followers, have entered it. I have come from afar to look for you. If you are valiant and courteous, no emperor, count, or king ever had such joy or good fortune, for I love you more than anything. Okay, so pause. She came from the other world looking for him. How did she know about him? I mean, do your Twilight Zone music. We don't know. Maybe she has a secret glass that allows her to see and she sees him. Maybe it's because he's disfavored and she wants to help him. Notice, no king, no emperor, no count was ever as lucky as you are. It's your lucky day, Lonval. He looks at her and saw she was beautiful. Love stings him with the spark that lights and inflames his heart. Other people have suggested it probably inflamed more than just his heart as he's looking at her nearly naked. He replies to her becomingly, that is fittingly. Okay. Now, back up for a second. If you are valiant and courteous, courteous, that refers to courtly behavior. 
What is meant by courtly behavior? Used to be the term that would be used to, to describe a man's trying to win a woman's favor, not meaning sex, meaning hand in marriage. That was called what kind of relationship? Courting. Okay, why? Because the C-O-U-R-T went back to the word for court, and the root of that word is cur, heart. Okay, so this is behavior of the heart, but it's the right behavior of the heart that is also to be found where? At the heart of society, the court in the Middle Ages. So the court was supposed to model the behavior for everybody else. Okay, this is why the courtly love tradition was so aberrant. <laughs> That's not the behavior you want the entire society to follow. So, he says, beautiful one, if it pleased you that such joy should come to me, that you should wish to love me, you could command nothing that I would not do to the best of my power, be it folly or wisdom. So, she has, has offered him what? She says, you're lucky. I saw you from afar and I came to seek you out. Why? You're going to be luckier than any king, count, emperor, etc. And he responds and says, you could command me to do anything, whether it were wise or foolish, and I would do it. Why? Because he's following, in that instance, both this and this. See, in the courtly love tradition, it's not just the, the, the wooing, so to speak, of a knight for the Lord's wife, again, adulteress, that doesn't necessarily begin down below by the night. It can begin by her. She can go, oh, la, la, come here. I want to favor you. And the response should be, whatever you want, I'll go do it. Okay. So notice, this has the courtly love notion right there. But his response is also entirely this kind of response. It's, it's right. It's moral. If you want me to do something for you, I will do it. Okay? We're going to get to the rest of the Pentecost oath and that kind of stuff in a moment. Unless I wait and get to that in Sir Gavin the Green Knight. I will do what you command for you. I will give up everyone. Now this is entirely within the courtly love tradition. I will forsake any and all for you. Notice what has not been mentioned at all at this point. Either overtly or covertly. Sex. It's not been alluded to, other than her lying there nearly naked. Kind of implied, maybe, but it's not discussed. I never wish to part from you. This is what I most desire. When the maiden heard him speak, the one who could love her so well, when she heard, the one who could give her that kind of love, she does what? She grants him her love, notice, and her body. They're not the same. Love is immaterial. I don't mean it doesn't matter. I mean it's non-physical. Her body, that is something physical. You know, what do uh, kind of popular not a popular myth because it's based on reality. What do guys often say to the women they love who they've not yet slept with? If you love me, prove it. Show it. Okay? That's kind of suggested here. Now Lonvol is on the right path. In other words, forget everybody back at Carlisle. He's got everything in the world right here. She gave him still one more gift. So she's given him her love. And notice, that's the first thing she mentioned, by the way. She said, I love you. She loved him from afar. Before she even spoke to him, she says. Okay? 
So she's offered him her love and her body. He hasn't yet received her body. He hasn't touched her yet. But then we're told she's going to get, he's going to get one other thing. He will never again want for anything, but that he will have as much of it as he likes. He will never lack material goods, material wealth, material. All right? Let him give and spend generously. She will provide him with enough. Meaning what? He can deplete his bank account, and it doesn't deplete. He can try to deplete his bank account. So look at the language that was used there. Let him give and spend generously. Why that order? Why not spend and give generously? Notice what gets preeminence. Giving. Okay? Okay. Lonval is very well situated. In other words, boy, he has it made. Is it possible to say that man is now richer than yes. uh, Arthur? Arthur can't spend and give generously. That is, he can't empty his treasure hoard, so to speak, his bank account. Why? Because it does have to be filled. This is like what kind of bank account? Unlimited. Unlimited. It's magical, right? It's similar to, okay? Notice my language. Similar to, not the same as. A variety of tales from Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament, what is it? Um, Elisha who visits the old woman who has the little jigger of oil and a little bit of flour. And she says, it's just my final bit. And he says, don't worry, let me stay with you. And that little bit of oil and that little bit of flour lets them live for a long time. She's able to keep making bread. Out of it. It, it seems to self-replenish. Okay? Feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. You know, you just keep distributing the fragments of bread and fish. And there's ends up being with the feeding of the 5,000, 12 baskets of bread left over. When there were only... What, two loaves and some five fish to begin with? How do you get 12 baskets out of two loaves? It's a miracle, right? So, that's why I said it's similar to. I'm not necessarily asserting that there is a Christian biblical illusion here. Because this is that Celtic fairy world, almost. Or at least she is. What she has to do with Christianity, I don't know. So, or at least at this point. Um, the more gold and silver, the more richly he spends, the more gold and silver he will have. Friend, she says, now I warn you. So, he's gotten the offer, he's gotten the carrot, right? Now comes the stick. I command and beg you, tell no one. I will tell you the whole truth, you would lose me forever if this love were known. You could never see me again or have possession of my body. And I, you know, I kind of think, I, my, my mind is so corrupted by things like Monty Python. I, I would love to have seen a my, Monty Python version of this. Because she would probably go, ta-da, you just pull everything off. You tell anybody, you don't get this, okay? He replies, he will certainly hold to what she commands. That is, I mean, keeping it secret, that's like at the top of that courtly love list of rules. And I did put on D2L the other day this document, and I already had up a list of like 25 or so rules of courtly love. You can take a look at those. So he says, not a problem. He lay down beside her on the bed. Now Lon Ball is well lodged. Yeah, and you could probably read into that a little bit more than I want to go into. Um, all afternoon he stayed with her until the evening. He would have stayed longer. But she doesn't consent to that. She says, no, no, no. You can't stay here anymore. You go on. I'll stay here. One thing I'll tell you. 
when you want to talk with me, notice that. When you want to talk with me, not when you want sex. There is no place you can think of where one could have his beloved without reproach or based on behavior that I will not be with you at once to do. And then we get the sex part implied. All your will. That is, wherever you are, if you want to talk with me, just kind of, you know, click your heels three times and go, lady lover, be here. And wherever that is, she says, I will be there. But notice, wherever that is, if she approaches, if she shows up, it will not be full of reproach or base behavior. That is, she will kind of sanctify. She will make whatever place that is a great place. Like, if you lose your house and you live in a hovel, we'll make it work almost. All right? To do all your will, no man but you will see me or hear my word. Now that's telling us, if you're sitting at the round table in Camelot, and you want to talk to me, boom, I'll be there. Even though all the other knights at the round table are there. You will see me and hear me, but they won't. And he's delighted when he hears us. He kisses her. He gets up. The maiden's walking back to his horse. They give him a change of clothing. All right. They give him water for his hands and a towel to dry them. Not quite told why. Are his hands dirty suddenly? You know. It's because he's going to eat supper with her. And then he leaves. Gets on his horse. Rides off. He comes to his lodging comes to his home and his men because he is the son of a king he has his own little retinue his men now what they're all dressed in new clothing too it's like when the ladies dressed him in the new livery the new outfit that he has all of his men got the new outfit too okay and that night he keeps a rich table meaning his table is overflowing and it's everyone's invited there was no knight in the town who greatly needed sustenance whom longball does not have brought to him and well and richly served if any of you are hungry, if any of you are thirsty, if any of you are in need of food or drink, come and eat at my table, Longball says. Now, that is directly tied to Christianity. Longball gave rich gifts. Longball ransomed prisoners. Longball clothed minstrels. Longball did great honor. There was no stranger or dear friend to whom Longball would not give. So let me pause for a moment. Pentecost O. Okay? These are both underneath chivalry. Chivalry, the code of honor that a knight swore to. Okay? This doesn't exist until 1100 or so. The Pentecost Oath was an oath, according to Mallory at least, that the knights of the round table swore each in every Pentecost, the annual celebration of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. Okay? In that oath, they swore to do right by others, to defend the defenseless, to help the helpless, to protect those who are lack protection, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to aid the poor, to give aid and assistance to widows and orphans. In other words, everything Jesus talks about in the parable of the Last Judgment in Matthew 25, verses 35 and following, you know, where he's going to say at the end of days, certain people go to my right, certain people go to my left. Those who go to my right did what? When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink of water. And they're going to say, Lord, when did we XYZ you? 
Anybody know what his response is? Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So when you visited somebody in prison, that was me. When you gave somebody a loaf of bread, that was me, kind of a thing. They took that idea and embedded it in them. That's how, quote unquote, Christian, the knightly model was supposed to be. It wasn't about one's personal glory like we saw in Beowulf. Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon Germanic heroic mindset, was my glory. Why? Because when I die, that's it. You know, the pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon Germanic mindset. This is post-Christian, or Christian, if you want. So he does all these things. Longwall had great joy and pleasure. He can see his beloved often. You know, whenever he calls, boom, she's there. She's entirely at his command. Okay? So we get talk about the same year, Feast of St. John. It's later on. Um, I don't know if that's St. John the Beloved or St. John the Baptist. If it's John the Baptist, it's probably August 29th, which is celebrating the feast of the beheading of St. John the Baptist. So it's sometime... What? A bunch of knights go out to play, so to speak. They're going to, you know, line 222, enjoy themselves in an orchard below the tower where the queen was staying. Why are they enjoying themselves in the orchard below the tower where Guinevere is? Showing off. They're young studs. They're like, oh, the queen's there. Let's go out strip our, you know, down to just our britches and swing our swords and maces and stuff. Because it's not just the queen in the tower, it's the queen and her retinue, her ladies-in-waiting. Okay? And they all go off, Gawain and Yvain with them, and then Gawain says, you know, we forgot Longball. We should have told Longball to come. By God, my lords, we do wrong not to have brought along with us our companion Longball, who is so generous and courteous and whose father is a rich king. They turn back at once. They go to his lodging. They persuade Longball to accompany them. The queen's leaning on a window ledge. She's looking out over all this man flesh, you know. She has three ladies with her. They looked at the king's household. And then she looks at Longball and we're told, considered him. What does that mean? She considered him. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. That is hot stuff, you know. That's exactly it. And so she sends for her maidens, and they're going to all go out and have fun with the knights. 30 or more maidens, 30 or more knights. Okay? They take the ladies by the hand. The conversation was not unrefined, meaning it was refined. They didn't talk dirty, you know, etc. Lon Ball goes off by himself. He's not going to have anything to do with this. Why? He has a lover. When the queen sees him alone, she goes straight to him. <coughs> Lonval, I have honored you greatly and loved you and held you very dear. You can have all my love, so tell me your desire. Notice her approach as opposed to the fairy lady's approach. Guinevere's a little full of herself. I have honored you above all. How lucky you are that I saw you, is kind of what she is suggesting, okay? You can have all my love, tell me what you want. Now, she's just offering herself there. It's a little different than what the fairy queen suggests. Lonmo, lady, let me be. Get the out of here. No. In either this behavior, courtly behavior, or the courtly love tradition, 
You never do that. You don't reject a lady. Or, let's refine that. You reject her in such a way that she doesn't feel rejected. In other words, guys, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Okay? We're going to see that in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. I have no interest in loving you. Ooh, that stings. I mean, she's just pretty much thrown herself at his feet. And he's like, go away. This is, remember, who? This isn't just some lady of Camelot. This is the lady. Within the courtly love tradition, she's it, man. For a long time I have served the king. I don't want to betray my faith to him. And when he says that, he is completely denying the courtly love tradition. Because one faith to one's Lord, it doesn't matter. He just don't let the Lord know. And then your faith is fine. With this tradition, oh, that's key. Because a vassal's first duty, first loyalty, first fealty is to his Lord. Then to his Lord's wife or love. So he's saying, I'm Arthur's man. Never for you or for your love shall I wrong my lord. The queen became furious, which is what happens in the courtly love tradition. She's just been spurned. Hell hath no fury, you know. <clears throat> she was angry. It's quite clear to me you have no interest in that pleasure. Meaning, heterosexual sex. People have often told me that you have no desire for women. You have shapely young men and take your pleasure with them. Ooh, where did that come from? I mean, talk about left field. That's you know way out there beyond Pluto. Base, coward, infamous wretch, my lord is greatly harmed by having allowed you near him. See, Hrothgar needed a Guinevere back there at Herod to tell him, unfair, no, base coward, infamous wretch, kin slayer. Okay. So what is she supposedly doing here? She's also now defending Arthur's honor. You shouldn't be around Arthur. You might corrupt him. And, Lonval, again, think, think, you know, dramatically. Think dramatizing this. Lonval sitting there going, in what strange new world do I inhabit that she's now lecturing me on morality when she just threw herself at me? And when he heard this, he was very distressed. He was not slow to respond. Out of anger, he said something he would often regret. And the poet is telling the audience something there. Don't respond out of anger. Bottle it up. I know nothing about that line of work, meaning homosexuality, but I love, and see, it'd be enough if he'd stopped with the first part. But I love and am the beloved of one who should be valued more highly than all the women I know. <laughs> and he looks directly in her eyes. And I'll tell you one thing. And on top of that, know it well and openly. In other words, you know, hear my words, read my lips. Any one of those who serve her, even the poorest maid, is worth more than you, lady queen. Yeah, this is, <laughs> he's figuring I'm screwed. Damn, I'm totally screwed. I'm going to lay it all out there. Is worth more than you, lady queen, in body, face, in beauty. Okay. In rhetoric, that's called what kind of attack? Ad hominem. Ad hominem. To the man, woman, 
He has just said, you're an ugly skag compared to the lowest chambermaid. Okay. In manners, oh, that's this. Courtly behavior and goodness. He's just said, you have a foul, rotten soul. Queen leaves the farm. Why? She's probably turning red, flustering. I need to go lie down. She goes into her chamber crying. Okay? She's going to tell the king. King returns from the woods. She tells the king. He gets angry. She tells him everything not. <laughs> she tells him what Longball said. She doesn't tell him that she threw herself at him. And the king gets angry and says, if Longbow cannot prove what he said, he dies. All right? King goes out, calls his nobles. Longbow gets arrested. He's gone home, calls on his lover. Busy signal. <laughs> you know, she doesn't answer. She ghosted him. He keeps calling. She doesn't come. He realizes... He's out of luck. He's brought to the king. 363. Vassal, you have done me a great wrong. You began to base a suit to shame and revile me and insult the queen. Notice, it's by insulting the queen that Arthur thinks Lonval has shamed and reviled him, Arthur. He says... You boasted, uh, boasted foolishly. Your beloved is far too exalted when her maid is more beautiful and worthy than the queen. Lonval denies the dishonor, just as he said it, and that he had not requested. So Lonval, notice, gives the full version of the story, just like Beowulf said, you know, oh, you heard one version. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. So he tells the rest of the story. You think that makes Arthur go, oh, okay, I get it. That's cool. She hit on you, you said no, fine. No, he doesn't do that. Okay? <clears throat> he says, you know, I'll do whatever you want. King says, okay. He gets all the knights in the round table. Notice the king doesn't make the decision himself. It's the knights in the round table who do what? They act like a jury of his peers. This is written, I think your book says something around 1170. It's in the introduction to Marie de France, which is 30, uh, what, 45 years before Magna Carta, where the idea of a jury of one's peers gets enshrined in English law. Right? So. They all get together. They judge Lon Ball should have his day in court. He should have a right to defend himself. How must he defend himself? Notice, it's not innocent until proven guilty. Here, it's guilty until proven innocent. How can he prove his innocence? By her showing, By her showing up. His witness has to, has to arrive, okay? So they tell the king their judgment. The king wants guarantees, that is, bail. And if somebody posts bail, this system, what happens if Lonvold skips town? The person who posts bail, who becomes the what's called surety, is the person who will be punished. Who becomes his surety? or Sir Gawain, depending on how you pronounce it. Okay? So the day comes for the trial. King again asks for the record, that is, they read out the charges and such. They go to sit in judgment. And we hear various people speak, which we're going to skip. And Longball says, I, I can't make her show up. 
They say, if you can produce her, and we all agree she's more beautiful than Guinevere, you're off. But if you can't produce her, you're dead. So while they're sitting there deliberating, two women come down the street. 473, extremely lovely, dressed in nothing but purple taffeta down to their bare skin. Everyone gazes at them eagerly. Gawain and three knights with him go to Lonval and they tell him. He shows them the two maidens. Lonval's happy, notice. Begged him to say, or excuse me, Gawain is happy. He asks to say whether this, this was his beloved. Wait, what's the this referred to? There's a noun, pronoun, disagreement error there. There's two women riding along on the palfreys. And he says, is this your beloved? It's like, which? What is Gawain suggesting there? Either, one. <laughs> Either one's head and shoulders better than Guinevere. The maidens go along. They get down in front of the dais where King Arthur was sitting. That is, they ride on their horses into the castle. They get off their horses right in front of King Arthur. And they speak directly to him. Notice there's going to be a big difference between this and what happens at the beginning of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight when the Green Knight comes into Arthur's Hall. <coughs> King, have your chambers made ready and hung with silks where my lady can dismount. In other words, cover these tawdry walls <laughs> because my lady is coming. Okay. He says, okay. King asks his nobles, judgment day, what's your verdict? And the guys are sitting there going, let's hold off just a little bit longer. We, we broke off our discussion when we saw these two. We've not made a decision. Now, and then they start, you know, talking again. Two more maidens come riding down the street, dressed in cool silks. They ride Spanish mules. They say to each other, somebody go tell Lonval. Yvain goes to him. Here come two maidens, elegant, beautiful. Surely it is your beloved. That is one of these two. And again, the implication is either of these are more beautiful than Guinevere. Lonval kind of looks over. No, nope, not there. They come in. They ride. They dismount. Provide rooms. Our lady's coming. He's, yes, okay. Come on, guys. Judgment. They start haggling again. Finally. 547, they were about to take a decision when through the town they saw a maiden come riding on a horse. In all the world, there was none more beautiful. By the way, the image here might be based upon the Anglo-Saxon story of Godiva. Lady Godiva, from which we get the name for Godiva Chocolate, who rode through town naked on a horse and there i don't remember the exact she had to do that as a means to prove something and it was told the people of the town and all the people of the town went inside their homes locked the doors turned away from the window so they would not see her so that her innocence her chastity so to speak would be left unsullied okay it was to prove a point about her husband or something like she rides a white palfrey. Why? Purity. Okay? Which carried her well and gently. It had a well-shaped neck and head, no handsomer horse. It's richly harnessed, etc., etc. She's dressed in a shift of white linen, which let both her sides be seen. So it's like covers here and down the back, but fully open down the sides. Laced. She had a lovely body, a long waist. A neck whiter than snow on a branch, sparkling eyes, white skin, beautiful mouth, well-formed nose, dark eyebrows, lovely forehead, curling golden hair, no golden thread, blah, blah, blah. 
Mantle is dark purple. Why purple? Royalty. Okay. Wrapped its ends around her. She had a sparrow hawk on her fist. Again, royalty. The greyhound ran behind her. The sports of royalty. Falconry. Hunting. No one in the crown, great or small, did not go to look as they saw her pass. There was no joking about her beauty. The judges saw her considered it a great marvel. Sir Gowan and Green Knight's going to open, and we're going to be told Arthur never ate at the Christmas feast until one of two things, or excuse me, until two things had been met. One, everybody had to be served before he would take his bite. Okay? Two, he wanted to see or hear a marvelous tale. That is, he wanted something marvelous to appear and happen, or he wanted to hear a tale of a marvel. All right? She comes along slowly. The judges who saw her considered a great marvel. She was not one who, not one who looked at her who did not grow warm with true joy. Mm. Yeah, mm. probably more than true joy. And someone says, Sir Companion, here comes one who is not tawny nor dark, doesn't have a tan, and is not dark complected. She's the loveliest in the world of all the women who live. Longball hears this, and he's like, yes, <laughs> saved, you know. In faith it is my beloved. Now I care little who may kill me if she does not take pity on me. What does he mean, if she doesn't take pity on me? Forgiveness. Comes to him and talks to him? Forgiveness. Forgive him. In other words, if she doesn't forgive me and show mercy to me, go ahead and kill me because I don't want to live. It's kind of part of the courtly love tradition. That's definitely part of the chivalrous tradition. <laughs> right? For I am cured when I see her. She enters the palace. Such a beauty had never come there. She dismounts before the king. She lets her mantle fall so that all could see her better. Some have interpreted that to mean she strips. So she just stands there nude. The king, who was very well bred, got up to meet her. All the others honored her. And she says, King, I have fallen in love with one of your vassals. You see him here in his lawn ball. He was accused in your court. I do not wish it to be held against him. Concerning what he said, you should know the queen was wrong. He never asked for her love. How does she know? Do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, queen of the fairies? It's like the fairy world inhabits this world we just don't see them. To use a science fiction phrase, it's like they're slightly out of phase with us. Okay? And concerning the boast he made, if he can be acquitted by me, have your noble set him free. And I think when she says, if I can acquit him of his boast, that is that his lover is more beautiful, is more fair, more gracious, better, you know, morality, etc. And I kind of think she does this. Right. Just take a good gander. What's your vote? There is not one who does not judge that Longball has completely won the case. He's freed by their decision. The maiden takes her leave. The king could not keep her. The very fact that they we're told the king could not keep her tells us what? He wanted to. <laughs> she had enough people to serve her. Block of marble is set up. They didn't just set that up. It's always there. Why? It's how you mount your horse. You step up on the block of marble, you get up on your horse. And so what do they do? She and Longball get on the white palfrey and ride off to Avalon. The very same place Arthur will be taken after his final battle against Mordred. 
in the Arthurian myth. From whence he will come again when Britain, England, has its greatest need, according to the myth. Okay? And no one ever heard another word of him, and I could tell no more. Now, one of the things about that, in Celtic stories, or stories dealing with Celtic lore, medieval literature dealing with fairies, in most of them, they're about usually men who get carried off to the fairy realm, and they're never seen from again. Um, the Thomas Chester version of Longfall, Sir Longfall, if I remember correctly, and I may be wrong about it, I might be com confusing it with a Scots version. In fact, I probably am. There is a version, I won't say it's Longfall, there is a version where a guy goes off, is kept by the fairies for years, and he comes back, and when he comes back, it's like time has not passed for him. Time has passed for everybody else here. And he describes what has happened. I mean, he's essentially kept as a slave, a sexual slave, okay, for the women in fairyland. Isn't that the king, the king killer chronicles? The king killer chronicles? No. Patrick Baldwin, uh, that guy who I think he was like fourteen or fifteen, uh, who gets sort of captured maybe by a fairy in her land for like forty something years, and comes back to his world one year too late. Yeah, and that's, that's typical. Time passes differently in the Celtic other world than it does here, okay? So, that was an hour, not a half hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, jump to it. And if we had time, if this were a perfect world, we would discuss Middle English lyrics and you know, a bunch of others. But, we're jumping to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, okay? I've already mentioned the Cotton Nero A10, that's the name of the manuscript, so Robert Bruce Cotton owned it. It was under the bust of Nero, etc. The poem probably dates from sometime around 1390, 1375 to 1390, during the alliterative revival. According to J.R.R. Tolkien, who did an edition of the Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and it's pretty much still the edition that is standardly used, like in graduate studies. Um, it was probably written somewhere around the town of Chester in Northwest England. In fact, all the poems in the manuscript come from the same place. They're probably by the same poet. They're all written in the same handwriting. As far as we know, the poet may have been the person who actually inscribed the manuscript that we have. Okay? Tolkien, Tolkien was a Great language scholar. You gotta, you gotta understand. That. I mean, he, the nuts and bolts, the sounds and such of language, he was just proficient at. He narrowed it down to within about a thirty-mile diameter, with Chester at its center. So a fifteen-mile radius, if you want. Okay, that these poems come from there. London is the cultural capital at that time. Chester is about as far away from the cultural capital as you can get. I mean, it is the backwoods backwater. All right? And yet, these get produced. So Gown and the Green Knight, commonly called the greatest romance of the Middle Ages, of the English Middle Ages. Okay? Three other poems in the manuscript, as I mentioned the other day, the Pearl Poem, Patience in... This one is variously called purity or cleanness. I like to use pur purity because it alliterates a pearl and patience. Okay? Um, the dialect, Middle English, is very difficult to read. It's not like Chaucer's dialect. Why? Because Chaucer writes in the Middle English of Southeast <clears throat> England, just slightly outside of London. It's the dialect that generally evolves into modern standard English. It evolves into Elizabethan, Shakespearean English, which evolves into our English. The Middle English of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, it's kind of closer, it would probably be closer to Glaswegian. In other words, go to Glasgow, Scotland, get off the train, walk around, and try to ask for directions somewhere. 
One of my kids once said, years and years ago, a guy who was in the United States for six months, he was from Glasgow, he was coaching soccer, and they had him, we were like, what the hell are you saying? Because we couldn't understand a word that he said. Um, that's pretty much what Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is to a modern audience, all right? There are three interlocking elements, motifs, structures, if you want, within Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. You have a beheading game, an exchange of winnings game, and I'm going to throw in another word here, a temptation or seduction game. And what the poet does, and we don't know who the poet is, the poet is referred to, in, if you, you know, look at it scholarly literature, as either the Pearl Poet or the Gawain Poet. And when you, if you write that out, Pearl or Gawain are italicized, then you have a hyphen, and then the lowercase word, poet. So if you write a paper or something about Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you would say, Gawain, italicized, hyphen, poet, unitalicized. You know, writes, etc. These three things are interwoven. They're interlaced throughout. That is, this one relates to this one, and relates to this one, and this one relates to this one, etc. Okay? There are similar tales, or there are elements of this that show up in other tales, like, for example, the Celtic or Irish Brick Crews, that's an apostrophe, B-R-I-C-R-I-U, apostrophe S, Beast. Your introduction mentions Fled Brickrin, which is the tale of an Irish hero. It's very similar, if not the same thing. I used to have an edition that had Brick Crews Feast mentioned in the introduction, right? We're going to get a name later in the poem, Burdalak de Hot Desert, or Burdalak de Hot Desert. The name means Green Lake. Burt is the same as Vert, like Vert D, Green. Green Lake by the High Desert. A lot of people, a lot of early scholars wanted to use that to try to locate the poem. Green Knight's name is Burdalak by the High Desert. So, or Green Lake by the High Desert. So they started doing topographical research. Where is there a green lake by a moor, a high moor? Well, there's a lots of them. When you get up into the Lake District of England, this is close to the Lake District, right? One other comment before we start. Why green? Why is he green? Okay. Early scholarship, early 20th century scholarship, a lot was written about this, you know, fertility, demonic, I have no idea why demons would be green or demonic stuff would be green anyways. We talked about people being green with envy. Why green? What, where does that phrase come from? I've never actually studied that, it'd be an interesting thing. But we do have the British Celtic green man tradition. You go to any old church, like 300 years old, any old church in England, or any cathedral, or Oxford, or Cambridge, or an old, the remnants of an old monastery, and you'll walk around and you'll see carvings all over the place or gargoyles even. In many of them, you will see on them one place or another, and some of these are very, very famous. You'll see a face surrounded by green leaves. It's called the green man. Vegetation god? No one knows 100% sure what this image symbolizes. Okay? But, and, you know, I... When I would go to England, you know, I'd always look for these. I had my camera, and, oh, there's another one. There's another one, you know, behind the high altar in a church. There's one. It's a pagan symbol, okay, in a church. Sometimes they're right at the entrance, over the entrance to the church doors. You've got this, okay? Um, okay. So, 
How does the story begin? When the siege and the assault were ended at Troy, the city laid waste and burnt into what? What the hell does Troy have to do with medieval Britain? Isn't that how they kind of mythologically trace their ancestry? Brit comes from Brutus. Okay? The Brits, the ancient mythology is, were descended from Trojans via Aeneas, etc. And you get that described in the opening, I don't know, 20 or 30 lines. In fact, line 20. And when Britain had been founded by this noble lord, because you have Aeneas referred to line 40, line, no, line uh, 5, okay? So when Britain had been founded by this noble lord, valiant men bred there, okay, had children. And we jump up very quickly to King Arthur. Line 30, and if you will listen to this story just a little while, I will tell it at once, as I heard it told in court. As it is written down in story, brave and strong, made fast and truthful words that had endured long. And I'm not going to talk about the rhyme scheme and the, the structural pattern, but you have a stanza followed by what's called the bob and wheel. Okay, You have a stanza followed by usually... A single line with two syllables, and then four more lines with eight syllables. Okay? And it's talked about on page 225 and one, two, three, four. The fourth paragraph on that page. I'm not going to talk about the structure or anything other than that. So we're told. One, it's an Arthurian tale. Two, it's at Christmas. Three, location, it's Camelot. Okay? King spent that Christmas at Camelot with many gracious lords, blah, 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 blah. Rich revelry, carefree, carefree amusement. The knights fought in tournament again and again. These aren't tournaments to the death. These are jousting tournaments to show off in front of all the ladies. Okay? Um, line 51 and following, with all of life's best, they spent that time together, the most famous warriors in Christendom, the loveliest ladies who ever drew breath, the finest king who rules the court. So we have what? We have the cream of the crop in terms of knightly chivalry. These are the best knights in the world, these are the best ladies in the world, and they all serve the best king in the world. Right? When New Year Day was so fresh and it had hardly begun, so now it's no longer Christmas, but it's now New Year's, but this is still part of the Christmas revelry. What are those days of revelry called? There's a Christmas carol, the 12 days of Christmas. These are the Christmas revels. They go from Christmas Day to the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. So it's Christmas Day, excuse me, it's New Year's Day. They're having a big feast. And we have, let's see here, line 73 or so. The noblest knight in a higher seat, as seemed proper. Guinevere is gaily dressed, placed in the middle, seated on the upper level, dressed to the nines, loveliest to see, etc., etc. But Arthur, line 85. Arthur would not eat until everyone was served. Now, we're not told how many people are there, but the general tradition is that there's 100 knights in the round table. 100 knights, 100 ladies probably, with underlings. So there's a few hundred people here. Try serving a few hundred people. Does Arthur get served first or does he get served last? If he gets served first, his food's cold by the time everybody else is served. If he gets served last, their food is all cold when he eats nice hot food. We're not told. And I don't, I don't literally do not know the dining, proper dining etiquette protocol during, this, during the Middle Ages. But I think it's an interesting question. 
He would not eat until everyone served. He was so lively in his youth and a little boyish. Now, this is one tale that portrays Arthur as young. There are a lot of Arthurian tales that portray Arthur as, you know, one foot in the grave. Meanwhile, Guinevere is young. And that's why she's got Lancelot on the side. Because Arthur can't, you know, produce, so to speak. But this one, he's young, she's young, they're all young, eternal youth, you know, that kind of thing. He hankered after an act of life, blah, 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 blah. He would never eat, line 91. He would never eat on such a special day until he had been told a curious tale about some perilous thing. So he won't eat until everyone is served. Now we get another condition. He won't eat until he hears a perilous tale or a tale about some perilous thing of some great wonder that he could believe of princes of battles or other marbles, not marbles, marvels, I'm losing mine, or some knight begged him for a trustworthy foe to oppose him in jousting. So, everybody had to eat, and then he had to hear a story. And the story could have any of a number of different kind of qualities, or a knight would engage in a jousting right there in the hall. Probably not on horseback, probably a sword joust. So there he keeps himself on his feet, chatting before the high table. There's Gawain seated next to Guinevere. What's that telling us about Gawain or Gawain? He's ranked highly. I mean, because you would have Arthur, probably Guinevere. I don't think it specifically says. Guinevere probably on his right. Gawain next to her. Where you sit in relation to the king indicates your rank. Okay. Agravain Aladurmain on the other side, the king's nephew. Notice both the king's nephews and outstanding knights. Sir Gawain and Agravain are nephews to Arthur. That's why they are seated close to Arthur. Blood relative. Okay. Skip a bit. First course is brought in with trumpets blaring. Blah, 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 blah. Um, the Green Knight rides in. First course had been served, line 136. There bursts in at the hall door a terrible figure in his statue, the very tallest on earth. This guy's like a giant. Notice, like a giant. I'm not saying he is a giant. He's just taller than everybody else. Waist to the neck, so thick, set, and square, and his loins and his limbs so massive and long. In truth, half a giant, I believe he was. Anyway, of all men, he's the largest, most attractive. That is, he's not only big, man, this guy's good looking. There is one little flaw, however, to his appearance. For a while in back and chest, his body was forbidding, both his belly and waist were becomingly trim. If you're familiar with The Incredibles, this is Mr. Incredible when he's in his fit and prime. You know, 58 inch chest and 32 inch waist. Just massive. Both his belly and his waist were becomingly trim, every part of his body equally elegant shape. His hue astounded them. What's meant by hue? Color. He's green. He's not just wearing it. He's green. His hair is green. His eyes are green. For boldly he rode in completely emerald green and all arrayed in green. His horse is green. His horse is arrayed in green. Everything is green about him. Okay? And we get a description of his clothing. We get a description of his hornaces. Hornaces. His horses, harnesses, the whole nine yards, all right? All right. So he walks in. We get a description of his beard, his haircut, all that. He rides in, skipping a bit. Uh, where is it? There it is. 
finally, line 224. He writes in right up to the high dais. Elevated table. Writes to the middle, looks down. Who's sitting in the middle? Arthur. He looks down, we're told. Where is the governor of this crowd? Glad should I be to clap eyes on the man and exchange with him a few words. He looks down at the knights. He rides down to one end of the table, looking at each of them as he rides. He rides down to the other end of the table, looking at each of them as he rides. What has he just done? Challenge them. What else? He also kind of disrespected Arthur. Oh, yeah. He totally dissed Arthur. When the fairy lady in Longball rode in, notice what she did. She went straight to Arthur. She knew exactly who he was. How? Because there was the neon flashing light behind him, you know. King with an arrow. Metaphorically speaking, of course. In medieval literature, you, you can always tell who the king is. The king has a mark about him. The way Shakespeare puts it in Lear is Kent says there is a mark of majesty. Something that says, this is the king. What has he just done? <laughs> you can't be the king. Maybe he's down here somewhere else. And he rides past him again. Okay. Waiting to see who had the most renown. For long, there was only staring. Why are they only staring? They're flabbergasted. They are totally without words. Okay? They think, notice line 240, the folk there judged it phantasm or magic. <laughs> I've never pointed that line out before. How right they are! And then Arthur confronts him. Sir, welcome to this place. I am master of this house. Hi, my name's Arthur. You know, shakes his hand. Be pleased to dismount, spend some time here. Take a seat. Have a brunch. And what you have come for, we shall learn later. That is, sit down, set a spell. We'll talk about why you're here later. Notice what Arthur is showing. Hospitality. This guy's big, he's all green, he's just dissed Arthur. You are welcome at my home. No, no, by heaven, by him who sits there. What is that? It's an oath. By heaven and God. To spend time in this house, that's not the count of my coming. No, no, no. Here's why I'm here. One minute. Because your name, sir, is so highly regarded and your city and your warriors reputed the best, dauntless in armor and on horseback afield, the most valiant and excellent of all living men, courageous as blah, 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 blah. I've traveled in fighting, dress in warlike manner, etc. He says, no. Grant me 273. Let me back up. 271. Since I look for no combat, I am not dressed for battle. He's not wearing a shield. He doesn't have a sword. He doesn't have a mace. Okay? He says, I'm not here to kill. That's what probably is meant by battle. But if you are as courageous as everyone says, you will graciously grant me the game that I ask for by right. What was one of the conditions Arthur had before he would eat? Some kind of joust. Bingo. Got his wish. Arthur, if you seek a combat without armor, you will not lack a fight. Now, if you're the Green Knight, what do you want to do at that point? Smack. I just told you, I'm not here for a fight. Arthur interprets that to mean combat without armor. I seek no battle. Hello. I assure you truly. Why not? Those about me in this hall are but beardless children. Yeah. Woo! You're 
nothing but a bunch of little boys compared to me. Like prepubescent boys is what he's just said. If I were locked in my armor, you know, no one here could match me. Now, what has he just done to everybody else in the hall? Well, at least half of everybody else in the hall. All the men. What? I mean, Lancelot's probably, you know, if he had a trigger, his finger would be twitching on it. Right? Did he just say what I thought he said? He's just challenged the manliness of all of them. And we'll have to stop there because it's 926. So we'll pick up around, yeah, we'll pick up at 280, 279 on, what is it? Today's Thursday, on Tuesday. So we're only like three dozen days behind schedule.